Right, good morning everybody. My name is John Telfer. I'm a, I'm a tour operator. I'm not an NGO. I'm not a consultant. I'm not into aid. Um, but I had a very happy coincidence last May time. And uh, I'll, to put this into context, I'll explain very briefly what we do as a tour operator. We run trips to 130 countries, small groups, about 14 people. Each has got a leader, each has been trained by somebody in-house, uh, our house being in Farnborough, in Hampshire. And an email came through. And normally you dismiss some emails, and it's from an organization called GIZ, which I'd never heard of before, ever. And it was one of those miracle emails, you know, it said, we'll provide support for providing training in a variety of countries to the tune of about 200,000 euros. Um, we've picked your company because of your links with sustainability, with our work at Surrey University, and on general risk management. And uh, it just seems impossible. So I did read it through to make sure it wasn't a scam, got to the end of it, and I immediately gave them a ring. So that was last May, just before the Brexit referendum. And that's where I learned all about GIZ. I'd never heard of them before, but they are the second largest aid agency in the world after USAID, I believe. And what they wanted to do was to form a commercial partnership. We wouldn't benefit financially, but they would provide the funding to get to people that we normally never, ever reach. Now, we will train the tour operators in country. They're the people that book our accommodation, our transport, the flights. We will train our tour leaders that escort our, our groups, and they're 95% local. But what I've always had a concern about is what about the extended supply chain? And I'm using jargon. I said I wouldn't use jargon before, but the extended supply chain, the drivers, the hoteliers, the local city guides, the people that never get any training or very limited training in many countries. So when we first spoke, spoke it's all about adventure tourism. And my belief is that when it comes to risk management, and that's understanding the risks that you take, minimizing the chances of something going wrong, and when it does go wrong, having a plan in place, Getting to these people is so, so important. It starts off with high-risk activities such as mountaineering, but gently I convince them to look at these people because that is where education and training is best spent, in my opinion, rather than on technical sports. They spoke to a couple of other people in the UK, and finally we signed our deal, our contract, in June last year. And from that point on, it's, it's flourished beyond what I expected. I mean, initially I thought, how is this going to work? Not having worked with a, an aid agency of any variety whatsoever, but they focus on deals with the private sector. What I love about them is that they train local people, so you don't have a Brit parachuted into a country. What their aim is, is to train up local people. And the way this is working is they're relying on our 36 years of experience of running tours to 130 countries and all kinds of different terrains and politics and standards. We've got a well-established risk management training system in place and to combine our experiences with other people's experiences, for example, Iceland has an excellent standalone risk management system called Vakin, along with the local people and not just what we think they need but also they reached out to local suppliers to find out what they wanted. They sent jeeps up into the hills of Kyrgyzstan, they talked to drivers in Georgia so it wasn't foisted, it wasn't top down, what it was was checking locally with the actual providers and then checking with the local tour operators or ground agents in our jargon and then combining their needs with our needs and our experience. Originally, it was just going to be for the extended supply chain, but then it moved on quite quickly. And what we did was we provided six training sessions, webinars, which were accessible to anybody in those countries. When we first started, the important thing was it wasn't just for the people that we worked with. It was to work with people across the whole industry in Georgia, Macedonia, and Kyrgyzstan. 
Now, Libby earlier said about uh, time frames and the Aga Khan having 10 years. Well, I'm afraid ours is just three years, but it will be renewed, I hope. And if it does work, if it does work, GIZ, a bit like us, they work in 130 countries. And if we can do it, to move on to hubs in Nepal and Turkey and Morocco. But it's early days. It's only one and a half years into the whole setup. I'm not going to talk you through that because I think I've just touched on it. I'm not very good with PowerPoint. I just tend to speak. Um, but their view is you train the local people and you train the local people to train the local people. That way you build capacity in country. They brought a level of formalization that we are not used to as a tour operator using their experience. And we've learned a whole deal from this, this, this setup. And that we've actually used in other countries where we do training. It's looking at the service provider. How do you reach the service provider as a tour operator in the UK? It's almost impossible, the extended supply chain. That was why I was so happy when we had this opportunity to work with GIZ. And not just in the capitals, get out to the sticks, up into the mountains, well away from the places where training, if any, normally takes place. It's not just the local service providers, but also the tour operators in country. If you can sensitize the main people in the capitals, the people that hire the extended supply chain, then the chances of this working is going to be much, much better. So we decided to set up training sessions for the tour operators that hire the extended supply chain and then start training the extended supply chain themselves. It's all done in the local language. This is one from Kyrgyzstan, backed up by a certificate of attendance. Again, it's not a certification at all, but it's to show that people have been there for the training. Branded some stuff up, which is visible for people to, to, to it creates a bit of an impact. And this was the first session a couple of months ago in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan, where people were taught basic risk management, instant management, first aid training, you know, how to avoid a crisis happening in the first place by some very, very basic safety checks, but when things do go wrong, to have a plan in place or how to build a plan. That brings me to the end. Sorry to speed you through all that, but I'd be delighted to take any questions from the floor. Are there any questions? I've got one for you, John. Um, you, of course, were brought in as experts to use the knowledge that you have from working in hundreds of hundreds plus countries around the world. What have you taken from it? How is your business changing as a result of the experiences? Okay. A good question, which I've been asked by several people. Why on earth are you committing all your knowledge to effectively open source? Well, in many countries, there's a finite number of hotels, there's a finite number of drivers, um, all tour operators use them. So yes, if I'm improving the lot for our agents and other agents and the extended supply chain, we all use this extended supply chain. So we're benefiting, other tour operators, other competitors are benefiting as well. But that's, that's not an issue for me. It's about building capacity, it's by training, and that way, with that, it protects or can protect the reputation of the tour operators, the extended supply chain, and also the country itself when it comes to incoming tourism. And how extended, when you say supp extended supply chain, I mean, tourism likes to look at an extremely extended supply chain when it talks about its, say, 10% you know, of GDP. It extends it as far out as hospitals and the money we spend on, say, pets when we go away from, on holiday. How extended is your work in the supply chain talking about? Um, this is a starter project, so we're looking at training around 150 guides and drivers and about 10 tour operators in each country. And when we went through this, I mean, the GIZ were incredibly rigorous, but I guess you expect that of the Germans. Um, it was extremely rigorous. Everything was laid out, all the funding, absolutely every single penny spent has to be accounted for. And I've never come across anything like it. Like I'm a stranger to this kind of world. And that surprised me. Um, but actually, I stood back from it and thought this is the proper way to do things, to make sure there's the maximum leakage into the local economy, um, not spending money on highly paid foreign consultants, 
to build capacity in country and for everybody to benefit. And then finally, you said that it's, you're open sourcing it. Um, now you're working in three very specific Central Asian countries, sort of mountainous regions, Caucasus. Mm -hmm. But say someone's sitting here and they're listening to you, but they're from the Caribbean or from yeah. Africa. Is it easily adaptable, easily replicable, the information? The three, the three centers that we initially chose, um, we wanted to go to areas where we could see the, the biggest potential improvements. It's also a trial and we're learning lessons as we go along. And once we get to the next stage, which will be in two and a half years, that's when we try to extend it to other countries. Now, we're not showing, we're not sharing everything worldwide because it, it, it's, it's pointless. There has to be a structure to it. It has to be training. Um, if there's anybody here from Macedonia or Kyrgyzstan or, or Georgia that isn't part of this, by the way, drop me a line. It is free. I mean, there's no charge to this, by the way. This is not a financial venture in any way. If anybody from those three countries that's not involved, please contact me. If anybody's interested that works in other countries, then I can link you up with GIZ so we can tackle different places in about two years' time. Because Morocco, uh, Nepal, and uh, Turkey, they're not set hubs. And I think the way to go forward is to have hubs. Everything to be online, a lot of it is online at the moment. The issue is converting stuff from English to local languages, and that's one of the biggest hurdles if you want to get to the extended supply chain. Um, hi, John. Um, I work in Mozambique, and we're doing a lot of capacity building there. Would love to have something like this going on. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about recruiting or selecting, or how, how do you go about choosing the guides that you're training? And do you try to um, influence that in any way, gender or age or any other factor? Um, we don't try to influence. We're trying to reach as many people as possible. So in Kyrgyzstan, for example, we've got a number of stakeholders. Um, there's a number of tour operators there local tourism authorities, governmental bodies as well. So the, the, the whole aim is to encourage people to see this as something beneficial for the country, potentially, um, but definitely for the individuals and the individual tour operators, because by training, you will protect your reputation or increase the chance of protecting reputations when something goes wrong and even better prevent things from going wrong in the first place so it's I've, I've got no no guiding hand in who's picked this is all down to the local organizations okay thanks <laughs>